Hello everyone, it's time for another edition of Adventures in Careerland. <laughs> okay, okay. We pretty much end the music. That's our music for now, but I want to say that Lily, our producer, and Isabella, our other producer, have been working hard to find music because we want to sound more sophisticated and more elegant. Although uh, we've had a lot of very positive comments about the music we have right now. But we are looking. If you're getting disappointed by the quality of that, we are looking. We are looking. And we've been fortunate. I want you to know that my name is Adriano Magnifico. We run this podcast with Lily Chen and Isabella Sorez from the Louis Riel Arts and Tech Center broadcast media program, where they do quite imagine. Imaginative, imaginative things and they really get versed and skilled in how to be a player in the media and communications industry. It's a great program. If somebody out there is thinking, boy, I wonder what I can do or where can I get some skill? This program's off the charts. One of the great programs in the Louis Riel Arts and Tech Center's cache of 13 technical and applied programs. So on this particular podcast, we are very fortunate to have a former student of mine. His name is Eric Bao, and he's a recent graduate of Nelson McIntyre Collegiate, who, who graduated uh, with honors and completed uh, some special distinctions, uh, something called the skills credential he earned, which we can talk about later. But Eric is on the program with us today. Eric, how are you? Good, Mr. Magnifico. Thank you so much for having me. Am I your first guest on the show? Well, you are our first official guest that we're doing this uh, 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 from different locations. We've had Lily uh, talk about her story and Isabella talk about her story, but we were in the same room, so it was pretty easy. So you're our first official experiment with a human being who's not in the room. So this is very well, special to us. So this is a yeah, it's a very special honor. Thank it's a, you. <laughs> it's a great honor. It's a great honor for you. Well, I, I hope you're feeling that way at the end of this. You might be thinking, what the heck did I get involved with these idiots for? Anyway, that's okay. So Eric, we're super pleased to have you. And this is a this is a podcast called Adventures in Careerland. It's a podcast about student stories and the kinds of decisions they make in the store uh, throughout their stories and the, the decisions they're making as they're moving forward. So um, I worked with you, just to, um, just to be clear, I've worked with you for the past couple of years uh, at Nelson McIntyre, and uh, you're one of the uh, fascinating people with whom I've worked because you've gone through a bit of a journey to your place now. So we want to hear some of your story, uh, what you're about, but I always like to start with, tell me about your family, where they came from, if they came from somewhere far away, uh, what sacrifice or what did they do to come here and what that means to you. Can you talk about that a bit? Sure. So I guess I can start with both my parents. Um, both of them are actually quite, they lived quite different lives throughout their teenage years and adult years, I, I would say. My mom grew up in a small rural farming community in China, uh, south of China, in a small city back then known as Taifang. And then my dad grew up in one of the biggest cities in China known as Shanghai. And um, I think, I'm pretty sure my mom moved here initially um, when she was about 18. So she finished her last year of high school here. Um, so, that, so that was pretty interesting for her because she was kind of in, at a crossroads for what she wanted to do with for the rest of her life because she could have gone to university or she could have um, worked at her parents' restaurant, which, which, which was their way of living when they first came to Canada. And then my, and then her parents introduced her to my dad and she helped my dad get here to Canada and then specifically Porridge the Prairie, which is where they were living at the time. And I guess, you know, that's how family works. So they, they had me, I guess. So, and that was right after she graduated high school. So for her, it didn't really seem like uh, a responsible option to go to university because she was either going to have to not rig me to, the, to my full potential or she was not going to have to do university full time, right? So she made that call to not pursue university and just instead work at her parents' restaurant and support me as 
a child, I guess. And um, following that, I guess, I think I believe they only lived in Portage of Perry for about two years. Then we moved to the city that all of us currently live in, which is Winnipeg, Manitoba. And I've, so I was born here. I grew up in Winnipeg most of my entire life. Um, I was actually the first in my family to be born in Winnipeg. So it was a new thing for all of us, especially since my parents don't come from an academic background or, and they weren't, and they weren't really familiar with how Canada worked in a sense. They didn't speak English. Most of their time was spent at the restaurant. Mm -hmm. And I guess that was kind of how I became a person because I spent probably my first 10 years of my life at my parents' restaurant. So I personally didn't really know much about the world aside from school, right? Um, right. And I guess following going into high school, um, you know, that high school, I think, is a wonderful opportunity to figure out who you actually want to be in life. Like, what, what do you want to achieve and what do you want to set your goals at? And for me, I think seeing my parents sacrifice so much time to raising me, it gave me kind of, I guess, a responsibility to like make my life as fulfilled as it could be, right? Because my parents sacrificed their lives to take care of me. And I, you know, I, I want to be able to one day repay that debt that they sacrificed all that time and hard work for to raise me as a child. Well, that's awesome. That's a beautiful story. And I, I couldn't help but think, and so you grew up in a Chinese restaurant. Yeah. Oh, that must have been delicious. Come on. That I mean, <laughs> in, a, in a way, I guess so, right? Yeah. Well, it was, but I, 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 I'm, I'm kidding around with you. But <clears throat> what did you notice about their work ethic and the kinds of things um, they did keeping that restaurant going and trying to make ends meet? What did you notice about work ethic and just about their attitude towards life? And you said a little bit about the family, how they sacrificed. But what did you notice about the kinds of people they were? I think, you know, I think the biggest thing I didn't realize was in school, when I was in, I guess, elementary school, it would be, I'd get off from school at around 4.30, and i go straight to the restaurant, you know. I didn't know that that's not what normal, I guess, kids do. I, I guess as a middle school student, I didn't really have a social life. And, you know, as a kid, you're supposed to enjoy, go out, play with your friends and whatnot. And, you know, every day for me was 4 o'clock, go to the restaurant, um, do what, whatever schoolwork I had and just help my parents at the restaurant whenever I could. And then I'd be home by around midnight and whatnot. And, you know, that's not a normal thing to do, I think, especially for a kid. And you don't understand, you know, how hard your parents work when you're a kid because yes. you, you don't understand the concept of time and, you know, and how time really is valuable and how time actually translates to money in a sense. And, you know, seeing them, you know, reflecting on that experience now, it's like, you see your parents work every single day of the week. You know, the, the restaurant was open seven days a week, so they pretty much never had a break. And for me, it was like, um, and eventually when they ended up selling their restaurant, where, um, when, when I got to high school, you know, it was like, oh, well, now I'm a normal student. You know, I kind of don't know what to do with all this free time. And that's when you realize that, you know, your parents were working their, you know, their butts off to, to support you and to help you grow as a, as a kid and also going into uh, high school. So the sacrifices they made while working at a restaurant seven days a week were, were tremendous. Hey, that's awesome. So you're very proud of your parents, obviously. And, mm -hmm. and, and that kind of work and sacrifice. We've talked about some of the immigrant experiences with the producer team we have here about uh, they were surviving all the time, right? We always talk about surviving. They, they were trying to figure out ways to survive in a new culture. You said they didn't understand the Canadian ways. Uh, and it didn't come, it never comes easily to people, alien, you, know, you know, people kind of aliens in an alien land kind of thing, trying to figure out, oh, well, how do I make my way? How do I find this? How do I become prosperous? How do I do that? So they pass it on to you. Do you feel any pressure to do well? <laughs> Um, I, I mean, I, I think so, right? Because it's like you you kind of have a sense of debt in a way because you see your parents work so hard when you're little and you're like, you know, if I'm the person that doesn't even meet half their, half their work ethic, you know, like what's the point? Because um, like right now, I, I, I currently live in a, I, I guess, relatively middle-class neighborhood and I wouldn't be living in a house 
with two stories if my parents didn't work their butts off seven days a week when yes. I was a kid, right? Yes, yes. And I, I always like to bring up the story of the parents because I think those are such foundational pieces around kids and about young students because where they come from is always a testimony to their sense of work ethic and their ability and what their goals and 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 drive might be uh, because they're living it. They're just living that. I love what you said when you said, uh, I didn't think life was any different than work until midnight after school. That's pretty cool. Right. That's pretty cool. The yeah. average Canadian kid, kid born here that has a few generations is not even in your, in your mindset. And um, sometimes, sometimes kids take things for granted that obviously you would never take for granted. And that is, you know, the work ethic, the opportunities you have. And I always saw that at Nelson Mack and you too. Like I always saw the Nelson mm -hmm. Mack experience was really, um, really a stepping stone and a springboard for you to come forward. Talk about like, I, I met you in grade 11. I met you a little bit in grade 10, but I really met you in grade 11 when I was there as the career and entrepreneurship uh, consultant there and working with kids in junior achievement and, and kids in some of the programs we, we were creating um, some larger scale programs around career development. And you, you, you jumped into that kind of programming. Why? And I think because I didn't know what I wanted to do with my career and I didn't know what to want, I wanted to achieve as a student. And I think for me, the only thing that made sense was to go to a program that would challenge my potential and let me figure out on my own what I wanted to do for the rest of high school and what I want to do going to university, right? Um, and, and I think it was, and I think the thing that really caught my eye in a sense was the, was the junior achievement program because it, it was an opportunity for me to learn something that I was, I, I thought I was interested in, which was business, and then also learn how to be a part of the team, right? Um, yes, and, and that's yes. not to say Nelson Mack and parents didn't do that because obviously our school was built up on the project-based learning program, but I just wanted something, I guess, outside of school that was also related to school in some way. Yeah, because school is a bit of a surreal exercise, isn't it? Like you're doing exercises right. in these compartmentalized worlds, and I think the, uh, some of the project-based learning at Nelson Mack tried to bridge the gaps, but would you say there was yeah. nothing like that junior achievement program? Yeah, I, I would say junior achievement is probably the pivoting point of my high school career for sure. Well, why is that? Um, sure, I, I could explain when I first joined the program in grade 11. Um, and as we were talking about earlier, uh, the, the mayor's council application, I think I, will, I asked you to help me for the, for the, to help me on the mayor's council application before I was actually I guess, involved in a sense of JA. Well, let me explain that to you, though. Let me explain that to the audience a bit, yeah. though, because you came into my office at, at Nelson McIntyre, and you were a, a, a young person in grade 11 who wanted to do more but didn't know what to do. And so you saw opportunities. And in the programming that I was running with a couple of the other teachers there, um, we were always connecting you to opportunities and to see what stuck. We were, it was like throwing spaghetti on a wall for you guys. Some of the stuff you wanted to do, some of the stuff you didn't want to touch, and other things you'd, you'd, you'd light up a bit and go, hey, I wonder. And so you came into my office after we mentioned that the mayor of Winnipeg was looking for uh, a youth committee that could advise and, and, and talk about how to... Uh, how to make Winnipeg more appealing and more more interesting for youth. And you, you saw that and you came and you wanted to join that. Do you recall that? Yeah, yeah. It was a very clear moment in my life for sure. But what I, what I recalled though, as, as we went through the process of talking about why you want to do it, because career development is simply and utterly about why. People choose mm -hmm. things, but when we ask the question why, Things turn into different kind of scenarios. And so I asked about the why there. We really couldn't come up with a great reason uh, why you mm -hmm. wanted to join that, except as a means to an end. You thought it would look good on a resume, right? Right. So what did you learn from that experience? Um, I think that's the point in high school where I finally figured out that you got to figure out, I, I think you got to reflect on experiences that, you, that, that, that you've done, right? Yes. And at that point, 
I think I didn't have enough experiences to reflect on. And, and I think that's the point when I learned that you don't do experiences just to put them on your resume or your CV. Use them to learn from them and to gain skills that are going to be valuable for your future, right? Be it leadership, teamwork, and whatnot. And that was, I think, the point where I really started thinking about if I don't do something soon to learn about myself, I'll never know what I want to do going to university. And that was a fascinating moment because as I remember the dialogue a little bit, as we talked about why you want to be in the marriage group, you're into it for the leadership potential. But uh, when we looked at the kinds of students that the mayor might want to select, uh, you, mm -hmm. I like what you said. I didn't have enough experiences. What we talk about in this program is you didn't collect enough dots, right? Yeah. And so you made it your goal after that because it was clear. We did the application, but I think I told you you're not going to get on here. Did I, do you remember me telling yeah. you that? Yeah, yeah. And, and I, as naive as I was back, was back then, I, I, I really thought I had a chance of getting it. But looking back on it now, I'm like, you know, I, I wouldn't even have been in the, in, the, in, the interview pile. Like, I, I, I thought, if, you know, looking back on my application, I don't even think they, they would have asked me for an interview. I think they would have just thrown that in the trash, to be honest. Well, you're being a little harsh on yourself. You had you had a few things you were doing, but you probably weren't. I, I agree with you. You probably weren't in the higher echelon of of the uh, of, of the students from which they would choose their 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 group. Right? You still had a right. decent resume, and and high schools and kids are full of students with decent resumes. But you were a student mm -hmm. who said, "I want to do a little more," and you came into me with that objective. And you chose an activity that didn't really fit for you at the time. I suspect it would fit for you now because of all the work you've done. That's just my right. gut feeling because you've done a lot more soul searching about who you are, what you are, what skills you want, what skills you're trying to acquire. And you've gone on past. Do you recall that you talked to me? I think it might have been at the beginning of grade 11 or grade 10. You wanted to be a pharmacist. Yeah. Do you remember that? Why did you want to be a pharmacist? Um. You know, I think the biggest reason was just to work in the community, right? Pharmacies are the centerpieces of communities because they're the ones who, I guess, support the people in the community just because every, everyone needs medicine at some point, right? Whether you're yes. sick, you're just looking for advice, right? Like, like your pharmacist is in your community can be a very important connection. Mm -hmm. But for me, I didn't. I don't think I wanted to do it because I thought it was say something I was interested in, but just because I thought the pay was good. Um, and I, and I, and I thought it would be a good, I guess a good thing to say that I want to do it because I'm community oriented. Right. Yeah. Now it's funny though. Now you're in the, you're in the Asper school of management, aren't you? Yeah. First year. That's a far cry yeah. from pharmacy. So you've been right. on a journey. That's the beauty. I, I, I recall you. I remember writing in a bit of an article. I write for the, uh, the Can't Star Lance sometimes. And um, I remember writing an article about you using a program, uh, a computer program that spit out you ought to be a pharmacist. And so you kind of latched mm -hmm. onto that. And I think students are looking for those, those, life, those life boys, right? Those, those, right. those uh, what can I do? What should I do? And even if a computer simulation says it ought to be pharmacy, some kids will just take that and run. But I really like right. your story because you, you said that's not enough. I need to go collect dots. I need to do more. So that's kind of right. cool. So tell us about uh, the junior achievement piece was fascinating to me too because you had your ups and downs in that program because the beauty mm -hmm. of that program is, and this is a shout out to the junior achievement organizers, um, it, 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 it's a real life business you're starting. It's not a high school simulation. Right. And of course, high school mm -hmm. does its best, but at its best, they are simulations, the work they do, or, or small pieces, right? The junior achievement program is you're starting a business, you have to sell product, you have to uh, create cash flow, you have to create uh, marketing documents that really reach out to target markets. And if you don't, you feel that you didn't succeed or that you did succeed. And that's, that's the beauty of that program. So when you did that in the opening year, um, a grade 11 for you, it didn't turn out exactly, it was okay, but it didn't turn out exactly the way you wanted it to be. Why? 
Um, so yeah, I guess initially I was, I remember we did, I guess like uh, executive election night, my first day in the program in grade 11. And I was really gunning for that VP of finance position. And I didn't get it for obvious reasons, right? I was grade 11. No one knew who I was and, and whatnot. And I think after that point, I kind of got down on myself. I'm like, okay, I didn't get an executive position. You know, what is the point of doing anything in this program anymore? Because, you know, I'll, I'll never be the person that, yeah. But I, I love that you persevered. Like you didn't get a leadership position you wanted and you learned very quickly. I, I like what you said. Nobody knew who I was. I hadn't done anything so that people would see me in, in a different light other than someone just saying, I would like to do this, you know? So right. that's powerful. In the second year of JA, you joined again though. And you, I want to say to you, you did a very credible job as, as a support team person in the in that grade 11 year. So as hard as you are in yourself, I can say I was pretty impressed with what you did. In fact, I recommended that you run for president of the junior achievement team because of what I saw. And then in the second year, talk about that program. Yeah. So in the second year, I am that was going into grade 12. I did enough experiences, I guess, in the summer to, um, to, I guess, connect myself with the community. So when I ran for president in grade 12, um, I got the position and I think it's because I guess people saw that in my pitch, people saw that I was, you know, going to be dedicated to my role and that I actually, you know, was not just someone who's doing it just for the position. Right. It's like, I was going to dedicate my time and my efforts to running uh, the junior, the junior student student business. Yeah. But and, Eric, Eric, you also built up a bit of a resume. You know, I recall you working with the United way program as well. Do you remember that? Yeah. And of course, you you took that on. What did you do in the United Way Ambassadorship Program? Sure. So we addressed a community issue. Um, it was the community issue was period poverty, which is essentially when uh, lower income women do not have access to female menstrual products. And uh, and I I think coming up with that idea was probably a very good look eye opening experience for me personally, just because. I'm a male. I don't personally have any experience with female menstruation and whatnot. And so for me, you know, doing that idea was kind of foreign because I was like, okay, well, I'm not comfortable with this idea at all. I don't know how I'm going to be able to do anything with it. But I think for me, the, the thing that I didn't understand was seeing, or the thing I finally understood after completing the whole thing was seeing the bigger picture. Right. And, so to address that project, we held a community event to create reusable menstrual pads. And um, that was the first time I think I've ever organized an event with teammates without any, any help from an external or organization. Um, because United Way pretty much gave us the funds to do the project. But other than that, they were pretty hands-off. And they're like, you guys decide what you want to do with the money. We're just providing it to you, right? Well, and that's, and, yeah, and, and, and the power of that is, like, you decided to become the leader of that group. Right. See, that's the powerful piece. When you said, I'm not collecting enough dots, that's a pretty big dot to collect. So now when you're, when you're, when you're applying for the presidency of JA, you have more things to talk about. Were there other things right. in school you were doing where you just said, hey, I'm going to go for this? Like, I really like your exploratory sense, and that's what you became after that mayor's meeting, like, I think you nailed it. That was a cataclysmic moment for you because you started yeah. looking to do things, to explore, to see what sticks, mm -hmm. to assert yourself in ways. I want to be a leader. Well, I'm going to test out what leadership looks like and how it feels. So when you did the United Way and then you did the JA piece and you applied for the JA, they voted you in. What was it like doing that yeah. JA piece? Because that's, that's a pretty big project. And Nelson Mack had a reputation. They won three years in a row. As, as Junior Achievement Company of the Year, and they were always close to the top. They always, for the past four or five years, they've always had the top numbers in, in volume sales, in actual sales numbers, and financial sales. So you, you were inheriting a pretty powerful machine that was already uh, doing pretty well. So what was that experience like leading that? Because that was challenging, wasn't it? Yeah, I, you know, I'd like to say that there are some days that I wish I hadn't become president just because the workload is it's, it's definitely different because 
it's especially since everyone is looking up to you to finish, to I guess make everything connect together, right? Yes. Um, especially when you're running a business. Um, it's, what did that feel like, though? What did that feel like? They're always looking to me. They're always looking to me. I think I felt a really big sense of responsibility. And, you know, at the end of the day, you have to see the bigger picture. Like, that's, that's the thing I learned most from Jay and you know the way to always see the final outcome. Um, and I think that's what drove me to push myself past those feelings of, I don't want to do this and this is too difficult. It's just that you want to do what's best for the, for the business, right? Yeah, and, and that was, I can say you did a great job and you learned. I, there were times when you were running meetings and I saw meetings getting out of control. I could see the frustration in you because the team was 20 kids who all had opinions and ideas and you had to learn how to manage that team and I was very proud of you because you just persevered at times when it wasn't going well. Do you remember a few of those where you're going, what, what have I got myself into? You must have thought that a couple of times. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Like meetings that were out of control, you know, I'm like, how do I, like, I don't even know what to do in this situation. Yeah. But, yeah. But then, you know what, when you continued that and did a great job with that and finished that off, you also interned, like this is you going off and saying, I'm going to try this. Do you remember interning with the chamber? Yeah. What was that all about? Uh, so I originally got in contact with one of my good mentors, Scott Angus, and his uh, brother actually works at the Chamber of Commerce. So I asked him to connect me with him because I really wanted to work to, to apply my skills in a real, I guess, business setting. And, um, and, and, and I guess he was kind enough to give me a, a marketing intern position at the, at, the com, at the Chamber of Commerce. And for that, I was supposed to be helping out at events and connecting with, with small business owners. But, um, Unfortunately, COVID kind of stopped that. I was only at the Chamber of Commerce for about a month before, you know, everything stopped because of COVID. But getting that experience, I think, was very valuable for me just because. Yeah. Yeah. No, well, well, did that help you make the call for Asper? Like, you were choosing experiences that were trying to help you figure out where your skills lie, where your attitudes lie, where where um, where your best thoughts are found what you gravitate toward was that intern was that chamber experience uh, a, a great moment for you? Yeah, I, w- I would definitely say so just because, and like you said, it allowed me to connect all the dots, right? It's like, okay, so I've done all these experiences in grade 12 and, and the chamber experience was at the end of my grade 12 year. So I connected all those dots and like, and it led me to the chamber of commerce. I'm like, this is potentially what I want to do for the rest of my life and what I want to study in university just because everything has led me to, to this point. Well, that's interesting because you say what I want to do for the rest of my life. You chose an Asper though, which lets you to, lets you um, kind of build a multitude of skills in you. So you can choose many things. I, I just saw a great study. Um, I don't know how great it was, but I saw the study from Gallup that said uh, most jobs in the next few years will be of a three to five year duration which means you're going to have to be dexterous and you're going to have, a, have to have a keen sense of your skills, what you're about, what you're doing, and where your cluster lies. I think it's more important now to think about where your career clusters lie than to think about the particular job that may or may not exist within five years of your earning that position. So I, clusters right. are more about the multitude of jobs, and you, you, you've done a lot of searching like that. So when you chose, I, I'm... I'm thinking of the other one, your summer job was, and I can see that your network that you developed, that you didn't have in grade 11, that you felt very frustrated mm-hmm. about, the network you developed turned into some other experiences. Did your network turn it, your summer job was an also a great job? Talk about that. And how did the network help you there? Um, sure. So the funny thing about that job, um, I, I got the job through a program called the Federal Student Work Internship Program, which is a federal run program by the government of Canada. And I first heard about it actually at a University of Winnipeg enrichment program. They had a, a, a student that was a speaker and she came in and talking about her, her job as a biology student. Oh, actually, no, it wasn't biology, it was a history student. And she came in talking about 
this program called X Week that I that I've never heard of before. And I really think schools don't advertise it enough. But um, but anyway, that's that's besides the point. But that's she, another she piece came of you. Of, but, but Eric, that's another piece of you extending yourself, saying, "I'm going to go search. I'm going to go see. I'm not waiting for something to fall on my lap." And yeah. so that's when you say it's not advertised well. It's advertised enough for people who are going to look for it. And you right. went looking for it, and that turns into something for you. And so that was awesome. Talk about that position in the summer. Yeah, so I, I, I put my application to the program, and actually getting an interview for the program is quite difficult just because of the fact that um, a brand and system pulls your, your resume and sends it to managers, so you never know if you're going to get pulled. It's pretty much a 50-50, right? Yes. Um, so, I, so I got pulled. I got the interview, and... You know, that was my first actual job. Like, I had never worked in a retail position before. I'd, I'd never had any actual paid job experience. So for me, getting that position was super, I guess, life-changing. Yes. Just because I, fi- I figured out that I could apply the skills that I learned throughout high school in an actual job scenario. And I can tell you in that position, just because I know a couple of the folks in it, um, they don't take high school students. That's not, mm-hmm. their, that's not their first priority. So I think you impressed the heck out of them. And they yeah. found it. But that's only because of the dots you collected along the way. Without those dots, you have nothing to talk about. You have nothing to talk right. about when it comes to teamwork skills or managing meetings or creating, op- creating opportunities for other students and mentoring others. You did a lot of that in high school. You slowly turned, you, you were this little seed of a person. And you slowly germinated and turned into this incredible really incredible thinker and and student that not only excelled with the marks because your marks are pretty high i think you're in the top three or four at nelson mac i guess i assume because your marks are pretty high i thought and uh but you also got this deeper sense of where you fit in the world and you're Mm -hmm. still on that journey would you say you're still on that journey hey yeah uh, yeah 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 for sure like i don't think the journey ever ends it just gets each, each piece you do, I think it just makes it more clear, right? Yes. Um, so what did you learn from the federal internship program? What piece became clear to you there? Clear to me there. I think it's always have something. I think don't ever go for one thing, right? And like you said, you know, how jobs are not, or, you know, how one job might not exist and to go with clusters of jobs. And I think that's where I really, where I really opened my eyes to, be, be skilled in different things, Justin, and don't rely on one experience to like push you through your through your entire, I guess, school life and your entire professional life. Just because there is a point where you where you need to have more than just one one experience to look back on, right? Yes. Well, that that's great advice. You would tell high school students that. It's important to what? Very quickly in a sentence. I think I was a high school student. It's important to explore your, your opportunities, um, experience them. You know, don't don't be afraid just because something is not comfortable for you, because that that thing might turn into thing that that you that you love for the rest of your life, right? Or right. Or, or or it might not. But either way, you're still learning something from that experience, regardless. So, do you think the pain is important? Feeling a bit of struggle. Uh, yeah, I think for sure pain, I think pain just makes you learn more about yourself and learn more about what you're capable of. If you, if you, if you experience pain and you can't handle it, well, then you know that maybe that experience or that struggle is not it for you. And I, and you know, that's okay because you might find things that might be difficult for, for other people, but might be a breeze for you. So, and, and, and the pain you persevere through might set you on a road you never even considered know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. So that's pretty cool. Hey, I like what you've been saying there, Eric. We're, uh, we're getting close to the end here. I, I really like what you've been saying about, hey, you just got to be a learner. And I, I just mm-hmm. like that the, you identify those, you know, the great moment where you figured out, I have to do more. I can't just go apply for things and think people will want me on their teams. I have to build right. my resume. And I don't mean your physical mm-hmm. resume, you know, the one, but I mean your resume as a person and get a yeah. keen sense of, you know, what, 
what you're capable of and what skills you bring to the table and a sense of what skills you want to acquire. Like those are so mm -hmm. important for young people, especially in an age when uh, this COVID age is messy in and of itself. But once we get through this, hopefully, then there's, there's, there's a whole world and a life to choose from. How do you make the right calls? Yeah, for sure. You know, and really the only way is to get this deeper sense of who you are and to, to see what sticks and to experience and collect as many dots as you can before you collect them. Some kids try to collect dots and they don't have enough. Like you did when you came to me, I want to apply for the mayor's event. You don't have enough dots there. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's a great p piece of advice, honestly, to go out and, and look for opportunities. Um, you've tried a lot of, I, I refer to them as prototype experiences where you've tried things. I remember telling you, try this, try this. And you, uh, and then you tried them, but they became prototypes, right? In an entrepreneurial way, mm -hmm. prototypes make, you know, in your, in your JA experience, the prototype was the working model, right? Our first one. And we right. try to iterate it and move it and, and test it out with customers. But I think experiences have that prototype experience too, that prototype sense too, where, um, when you try it out, you figure out what doesn't work for you as, as if you're your own customer. And I think you've done a lot of that. Uh, I just think something good's going to happen to you, Eric. I, uh, I wish you well. How's it going at the Asper school? Uh, I mean, it's definitely not typical considering everything is online, yes. but, um, I think I'm making the, the most of it for sure. Okay. And you, you told me just as we were chatting before we got on air here that, uh, you're taking a philosophy course. Yeah. Something near and dear to my heart. And how do you feel about that? Uh, I think it's one of the most interesting courses I've actually taken that's not related to business at all. So that's good. And, and yeah. I, the reason I bring that up is there's nothing so absolute about choosing one thing and think that's the, that's the piece. You talked to me about some of the pain of doing this philosophy. I've never really thought this way. I've never really, I, I've never really extended my brain in this way. I'm used to doing numbers mm -hmm. and science and that kind of thing. And I can tell you, I love that you're doing that. I love that you're trying to find the art and the poet in you. That's what Lily talked about once, how important it is to look for your art. When you do philosophy and you do some of those humanities courses, you're also connecting some of that technical knowledge that you're going to learn through Asper and some of the, uh, uh, and, and, and some of the more applied knowledge to some of the humanities. When you get that piece of you, I think that's powerful. Hey, Lily or Isabella, anything you, you, you want to ask Eric or uh, think about, want to comment about Eric's experience? Um, in fact, I have, I have prepared some questions, but I don't think we have enough time. But uh, I just want to follow up what you have said about the philosophy. And uh, what I suggest, Eric, is if you have time, try to learn something about psychology. Oh, yes. Yeah, to be a, 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 a manager or to be a future successful people, the skills is important, but to know people, to know the logic of the people thinking and to know how their behaviors, things happen, why, and to know all these things, you will be a very powerful and successful manager. Wow. That, Thank that, you. That's Thank if you. you want to be a manager, right? But that's cool. Right. But no matter what you want to do, I yeah. think, I think Lily's advice is, uh, is solid. Isabella, you're the same age as this guy. Yeah. And definitely could relate a lot to your story because I helped my dad out, um, in his business and I definitely know how that feels like, but I really like that you're a, um, whole journey when you were in high school of going um, through so many different experiences to try to figure out what you wanted to do in life because I feel like people don't really go to volunteer or reach out to try new things that they didn't try before because either they are too afraid or they are not um, willing to take um, like a different course to what they planned. So I really like that your journey has a lot of that, that you try new things and that became who you are. And I definitely think that's very inspiring to people from our age or even younger. Oh. Yeah, for sure. I, I, I think, you know, uh, it might sound cliche, but it's never about the destination, but the journey is definitely the most important. Right on. Hey, that's a great note to end this on. Eric. You are our first outside interview, and you've been spectacular. I don't know what else to say. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. I well, 
I, yeah. I, I love that you did this. You're, you're an inspiration to me always and um, an inspiration to our producers here too. So thanks for your story. We appreciate it. And um, I, I think your great outcome of this is you're going to inspire someone else to think a little differently about their possibilities. So congratulations. And I want to hear more. Keep in touch with me, obviously. Want to hear more about your story and where you're going, always. Okay, cool. Thank you, thank you Mr. Magnifico, Lily, and Isabella. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Take thank care, you. my friend. It's time for that fateful moment where we end our podcast. Uh, is it time for the music? We're actually looking for our music, but we don't have it, so...